Who was the first guy of the ancient world to say, I'm God's chosen representative. Now, do as I say, or else he will strike you down. Was this by chance some guy who had had enough, or was it a societal decision? Whatever it was, it spread far and wide. Maybe it was the people reenacting what they saw in the sky. Wait till you hear this. The ritual surrounding ancient kings amounts to a summary of ancient beliefs about the universal monarch. For every local sovereign was the successor and representative of the great god who ruled the world during the Golden Age. The rites of kingship testify to the enormous power which the collective memory of this god king held over later generations. David Talbot lays out in the Saturn myth what ancient chroniclers of kingship from Egypt to China to Italy to pre-Columbian Mexico all trace the line of kings back to the first king, a supreme cosmic deity who founded the kingship rites. When history begins, there are kings, the representatives of the gods. No greater mistake could be made by historians than to assume that the sovereignty of kings grew out of economic or material concerns. Instead, the crucial forces were religious. The king was a product of ancient ritual, and the ritual centered in cosmic beliefs which, for several millennia, overwhelmed these earthlings' perception. Can we even comprehend these deep-rooted perceptions? In the king's life and rule originated the prerogatives and obligations of all local sovereigns. It was the duty of every king to perform the rites instituted by the great God in the beginning, and to renew, if only symbolically, the primordial era of peace and plenty. In the ritual, the king turns the wheel of law first turned by the great God, rides on the God's own cosmic ship, takes a spouse, the Great Mother, builds temples and cities patterned after the God's celestial abode, and subdues the forces of darkness, just as the God himself had defeated chaos in the beginning. Whatever the marvels of the Great Father, it is the duty of each local king to repeat them, or at least ritually to reenact these accomplishments as if it were the Great God himself. In his study of kingship in Egypt, Henry Frankfurt tells us that the great god was the first king. Whether named Ra, Kepri, or Atam, he is the prototype of Pharaoh, and the texts abound in phrases drawing the comparison. To certify his authority as a successor of the universal monarch, the king credits himself with having introduced an age of abundance like that of the ancestral sovereign. Thus, Thotmose III not only sits upon the throne of Atom, for example, but claims to have achieved what had not been done since the time of Ra, and to have restored conditions as they were in the beginning. Amenhotep III strives to make the country flourish as in primeval times. Similarly, when the Sumerian king Dungi ascended to the throne, the people supposed that a champion had arisen to restore the paradise which existed before the flood. Each king, states Alfred Jeremiah's, was expected to produce the wonders of the great god, the primeval king. Thus does Ashurbanipal proclaim that upon his ascension to the throne, Raman had sent forth his reign, the harvest was plentiful, the corn was abundant, the cattle multiplied exceedingly. Among the Hebrews, every king is a messiah, and at times the hope is expressed that the king will introduce a new golden age. Such is the test of the just or good ruler who brings prosperity and a fruitful earth. This belief, which seems to have held sway over the entire ancient world, receives insufficient attention from historians. It points directly to the extraordinary memory of the universal monarch. Consider this, Homer gives as the ideal a blameless king whose fame goes up to the wide heaven, maintaining right, and the black earth bears wheat and barley, and the trees are laden with fruit, and the sheep bring forth and fail not, and the sea hives store of fish, 
and all from his good guidance and the people prosper. Can this be anything other than the lost age of Kronos, the god whom shone brightest the planet Saturn as suggested in Talbot's assertion? Why should a fertile soil confirm the righteousness of kings? The connection becomes clear once one takes the universal monarch as more than an esoteric fiction and recognizes him as the shaping force behind the ideals of kingship. Just as peace and plenty followed in the footsteps of the first king, they should follow those of his successors who share in the charisma of the great predecessor. The further we go back in history, the more evident does the king's divinity become. In the Near East, the whole essence of kingship was based far more on theological than on political considerations. It was self-evident that the king was the magical source of welfare and prosperity for the entire organic community of man, animal, and plant. From him flowed the life and prosperity of his subjects, the increase of the herds, and the fertility of the land. This image of the local king is drawn directly from the image of the universal monarch. Thus did every ancient ruler call himself the king of the world and claim to radiate power and light. The Mayan ruler declared himself as king of kings, ruler of the ancient world, regent on earth of the great Itzam Na. What one famous author of the 20th century called an inflated notion of grandeur seems to characterize all ancient kings who shine like the sun and direct the heavenly motions. But the reason must be appreciated every king was in a magical way the universal monarch reborn. The institution and ritual of kingship point to the same great god and the same golden age, as do the myths of cosmic beginnings. In what historical conditions did this collective memory originate? And if the universal monarch governed the entire heavens as the god won, why was he called an ancestor? But what do you guys think about this anyway? Comments below and as always, thank you for watching.